In August 1988, an unfortunate mishap shocked attendees at the Rammstein Air Show near Kaiserslautern, West Germany. About 300,000 people had congregated to watch the Italian Air Force display team perform a beautiful yet risky act. Most of them were American servicemen and their families. But in merely seven seconds, a startling mid-air collision between three aircraft fell out of the hands of German and American authorities. A world-class team. As far back as the 1930s, Different Italian commands had sponsored several unofficial airborne aerobic teams, but the 313th Aerobic Training Group replaced them all. The group, also known as National Aerobatic Team Frecce Tricolore, or Tricolor Arrows, was born in March of 1961. It's based in the Udine province at the Rivolto Air Base, and its objective was to become a permanent training unit for pilots to practice air acrobatics. To this day, they amount to the world's largest acrobatics patrol. Their repertoire includes around 20 varied acrobatics performed in a half-hour show. Their fleet consists of nine close-formation aircraft and a soloist, and they are considered the most famous display team in the world. The team flies Air Maki MB-339A Pan jet trainers, two-seat fighter aircraft capable of reaching 898 kilometers per hour at sea level. Developed in the 1970s as a trainer and light attack aircraft, the MB-339 flew for the first time in 1976. In addition to being part of the Italian Air Force display team, the model was sold to export consumers and had a combat role in the Argentinian side of the Falklands War in 1982 and the Eritrean-Ethiopian War in the late 1990s. On August 28, 1988, the Frecce Tricolore was scheduled to perform a show at the Rammstein Air Base in front of thousands of spectators. Their main act was called the Pierced Heart Formation, and it involved 10 Air Maci MB-339 jets divided into two groups. They would all create a heart shape in front of the audience, right along the runway. To complete the lower tip of the figure, both groups had to pass each other parallel to the runway while a single aircraft pierced the heart, flying towards the audience. The aircraft took off at 3.40 p.m., and four minutes later, what should have been an enjoyable sight turned into pandemonium. Chaos. The Pony 10 jet was piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Ivo Nutorelli. This jet was supposed to do the piercing act, but collided mid-air with two of the passing jets coming in the opposite direction. It then crashed onto the runway, and the resulting fireball flopped into the spectator area. The shattered fuselage hit the crowd and finally stopped against a refrigerator ice cream trailer. The crash area was only a few feet away from the so-called best seats in the house, but the crowd had no time to react and flee as the collision and subsequent explosion took a mere seven seconds. Simultaneously, the Pony 1 jet crashed into a UH-60 black helicopter used for emergency medical evacuation, fatally wounding its pilot, Captain Kim Strader. The jet's pilot managed to eject, but his parachute didn't deploy, and he crashed into the pavement. The second affected aircraft, Pony 2, disintegrated in the collision, and a rain of debris fell along the runway. Meanwhile, the rest of the squadron regrouped and landed at Sembak Air Base, about 19 miles east. After the catastrophe, around 500 people required hospital treatment, and over 600 others showed up to donate blood. Overall, there were 67 fatalities, out of which 28 lost their lives on site due to being hit by loose parts, concertina wire, and other debris. The three pilots, Nutarelli, Lieutenant Colonel Mario Naldini, and Captain Giorgio Alessio also perished. The UH-60's Captain Kim Schroeder was the last one to pass away, 20 days after the accident at the Brook Army Medical Center in Texas. Out of control. Serious shortcomings from both German and American authorities were eventually revealed. 
the German civil and American military commands were not capable of handling the grand-scale emergency, and rescue work was hampered by insufficient coordination and cooperation. Firefighters arrived at the scene two minutes after the collision, followed by American ambulances and rescue helicopters within minutes. The first German ambulance helicopter arrived within half an hour, but U.S. personnel did not allow the German vehicles into the base in time. It wasn't until 4.28 p.m. that enough ambulances were available. Although the American vehicles were the largest and quickest means of evacuation, they lacked sufficient treatment resources. And to make matters worse, it became highly complicated to find the injured among the chaos. A doctor over the radio detailed the magnitude of the situation, quote, Not all the injured people are transported away by helicopter or ambulance. There's total chaos around us. And some of the injured are even transported on pickup trucks that are not leaving on emergency exit. They're driving beside the drifting visitors. Moreover, the Rescue Coordination Center in Kaiserslautern was completely unaware of the scale of the calamity. Radio communication with the German headquarters for emergencies gives more context, quote, we don't know yet what had happened, how many injuries, and what else. The leading emergency medical did not send any feedback yet. A paramedic at Ludwigshafen, 80 kilometers away, later said about a bus that came in full of injured people, quote, There was no paramedic attending this transport. Just a non-German-speaking driver, unfamiliar with the area, on an odyssey through the town until he was able to find the hospital. By 6.05 p.m., a paramedic from an ambulance helicopter stated, quote, we found a large number of severely burned, badly injured people, absolutely unaided. Fifteen minutes later, two platform trucks were transporting bodies away from the scene. Aftermath The authorities received heavy criticism for how the situation was handled. A doctor complained that, quote, it was not possible to find an officer in charge, a director of operations, or even a contact person. Asking several action forces, paramedics, police officers, nobody could name a director of operations. I was asking for a managing paramedic of the operation to coordinate the evacuation, but there was none. Further inquiries proved that differences between German and American protocols made it impossible to act as one coordinated effort. A single standard was then codified in 1995. A counseling center specialized in crises was established at a nearby chapel, which remained open for the week. Base mental health professionals also provided group and individual counseling in the following weeks. The response workers received checkups two months and then six months after the accident. Several theories circulated during investigations on the actual incident. Footage from the collision showed that the Pony 10's landing gear was deployed, perhaps to slow down the ballistic trajectory of the aircraft. It was also said that the aircraft could not reach the desired altitude, but nothing was proven. Furthermore, German journalist Werner Reith went as far as to suggest in 1991 that the technical problems on the Pony 10 could be attributed to sabotage. Reith claimed that Nutarelli and Maldini could have known undisclosed details about another air accident, the Ustica massacre, which happened in 1980. But authorities dismissed the idea. At the time of the Rammstein air show disaster, it was the most lethal accident of its kind in history. It still remains the third most lethal aviation accident to take place on German soil. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like it and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels. And let us know in the comments below what you think of air shows and the Rammstein accident in particular.